Greetings everyone, coming to you from the Church of God of Prophecy in Arcadia, Florida. This Bible study that we'll be starting will be a series. If I was doing a Sunday morning Bible study or a Wednesday evening Bible study, these would probably take several months, just these first few verses in the book of 2 Timothy, 3rd chapter. <clears throat> so... Any time that we do kind of a synopsis, that's not the full meaning behind everything we give you as we have time. So the message will be titled, The Last Days, and it's going to be a series. Let's bow our heads and pray and invite the Lord, the Holy Ghost, the Father, into the, our gathering today. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you today giving you the praise, the honor, and the glory in all things through and by your Son, Jesus Christ. By the power of the Holy Ghost, asking that you anoint my mouth, my lips, my heart, <clears throat> to bring forth that that you would have me to speak. Ask that the hearts of the people <clears throat> be receptive, God, to your word, to what we're teaching. And may they forever use their Bibles as a reference and also pray to you, the Godhead, for clarification if there's uh, any thoughts differently. Let's go to Romans chapter 8 and verse 7 and uh, while we're going there I just want to say that up till this point Paul has been teaching exhorting Timothy about being a pastor he's uh, talked to Timothy about how he, how he was raised in a house with his grandmother and his mother to understand and to love the Lord and Paul, as he does in many cases, uh, once he reaches a, a, his point, I think, I can't speak for him, but I think when he reaches his point that he will change the subject and go on to other things. He <clears throat> doesn't seem to dwell a whole lot uh, on things over and over and over again, although he may, by the Holy Ghost, repeat them in different uh, books. So Romans chapter 8, verse 7. Let's read that. Okay. Because the carnal mind is me against God. For it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. What does that mean, the carnal mind? Well, we, we can kind of look at it this way. We have groups of people. We have Christians. We have sinners. And we have those that claim to have a relationship with Jesus Christ, but they don't have a relationship with him. They know him in name only. So they think their relationship is cemented, which means that their mind <clears throat> thinks that they can do things of the world and then go to church and God is okay with it. Well, we can't live in the world and in the spirit of the Lord at the same time. So there's a gap in there to where all of us, if we've sinned and come short of the glory of God, we can repent and, and straighten our lives out. So the carnal mind, he's not subject to God or God's ordinances or God's commandments or the word of God. He just simply says, I do what I want to do and I'm sure that, that it's okay with God. So that's the carnal mind. He's kind of the third wheel, if you will, that just thinks, well... I can go out and dance and party and get drunk and go to church on Sunday morning and, and everything will be all right. So Paul switches gears here, as I said, by now switching to the church. And let's read uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3 and let's read a few verses. Now, Paul now has switched the topic to what Timothy would possibly see in the church he would pastor. Now, I want to make a brief statement here. These things that Paul stated in these first five verses, no doubt were there when, <clears throat> before the flood of Noah. They were there before Sodom and Gomorrah. Paul is saying, more or less, through experience, and, and I find it quite amazing in, in thinking about this lesson of how Paul, they think, 
history thinks he had several PhDs. Well, in order to be able to bring these verses out to Timothy, I want to think that Paul had seen these individuals, these people, and knew what what uh, what part they played in the in the Christian life in the church. So let's read a few verses in Timothy chapter three, starting with this. Know this also that in the last days. Perilous times shall come for men. Of course, that would include women. We want to include uh, everyone that's come to the age of accountability. Shall be lovers of their own selves. Covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy. Verse 3. Without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers those who are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. Having a form of godliness, which is a pretty powerful statement here, verse 5 is, is really powerful among the others as well. Having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof from such turn away. Now, he's talking about the church here. So, when Paul is speaking of the last days, he is talking about before the rapture. He did not know the time of the rapture, so I'm sure he phrased it in a way from the Holy Ghost that in the last days before Jesus comes back, that perilous times shall come. The expression, the last days, refers usually to the period of time of this present age before the rapture. So the last days. Uh, my father passed away, was a pastor in 1981, so that's, uh, this September will be about 41 years he's been gone, and he's waiting for that to take place. His soul and spirit are in heaven. So let's continue on this session. I've put a, a session out there on the rapture. Now, the, the current church as a whole is in a state of apostasy. Apostasy, a lot of individuals, preachers, teachers, also equate that to the Laodicean church. We're in a state of apostasy. Now, this message may seem to be very negative, and the ones coming up will probably seem to be very negative. But if we know God's word and understand God's word, we have, to, we have to teach and preach as the Holy Ghost puts it on my heart. Now, even though the church is in apostasy, after we finish this series, we're going to go ahead and get into how the church can come out of the apostasy. Continuing on, he gives examples to Timothy of what will happen with the church. Now, when we see the perilous times and the blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unfaithful, unholy, we think about the world. I've heard people say, and I've said it as well, boy, the world is getting worse and worse and worse. Well, let's look at our lives as Christians, things that's coming into the churches. They want to bring worldly music in and try to put some Christian thoughts behind it and strobe lights and fog lights and turn down the lights and do all this kind of stuff. So we see that the church, as we go along in the church, that it's dragging, pulling, inserting, trying. I'm going to use the word trying to bring these things into the church. In some cases, it's actually happening. He gives examples to Timothy of what would happen with the church. He's not talking about the world. He's talking about the church here. These were things that Timothy himself would see. No doubt, as I said earlier, Paul had said those and seen those, I should say, and he knew that they were there. Okay, sins of various degrees of gravity are brought together more or less indiscriminately. Paul said they would creep in. One, one writer said they would creep in. Catch women unaware, men unaware as well. With the idea of possibly pointing out that in God's sight, all sins are equally grave. Whether they are sins of the flesh, 
or of the Spirit. Let's stop right there for a moment. Sins of the flesh or sins of the Spirit. Wow. Okay. Sins of the flesh is when we are married and we cheat on our husband or wife. That's a sin of the flesh. When we get drunk, blind drunk, and say we're Christians, knowing that the, the temple that I live, the body here, the Holy Ghost lives in that temple. And sins of the Spirit, or the Spirit. What does that mean? That means that if the Holy Ghost is pulling me back to Jesus Christ with things in my life, if I continue to do those, we have to give it a word. And that word would be sin against God because the Holy Ghost will never pull us back to Christ in error. He will always let us know that what we're doing, getting more caught up in boating, golfing, those things are permissible. But if it becomes so to the point we don't read our Bibles, study our Bibles, go to church, whether committed against our God or our fellow man. Don't be angry with our neighbors. Forgive. Love one another. We can sin against our fellow man as well. These sins, common in the first century, are flourishing also in alarming measure today. Okay. I'll let you sort it out and then see how that it's common that People go behind other people's backs. That's the flesh trying to encourage the spirit to agree with them. God's not going to agree with anything that's contrary to his word. Hallelujah. Verse 5 is the most disturbing thought in this paragraph. Having a form of godliness. Let's continue. Having a form. Pretend to be Christians. I'm not here to judge you. I'm here to teach what this Bible, what this book says. And to the best of my ability, live by it as well. Verse 5 is the latest, is, is the most disturbing thought in this paragraph. All of these things that Paul mentioned from 1 through 4 was one continuous sentence. He never stopped saying this would happen, this would happen, this person would do this, and this that person would do this. That's all one sentence. As Christ's return nears, these characteristics will intensify. Having a form of godliness, that means having an outward appearance of that without spiritual works. Let me read that again. Having a form of godliness, having a form of godliness, but having an outward appearance of it without spiritual works. They look like whatever. Now, let me just throw this in here. Uh, of course, in my lifetime, I've gone to different churches. I was in Kentucky and in Illinois and now in Florida. The Bible teaches us if we see anything that we don't think is lines up with God's word. Uh, when somebody preaches a message or teaches, whatever the case may be, try the Spirit. Ask, ask the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. Is, is this for real? Is this what I want? Don't be afraid to ask God to question a pastor, a minister, a teacher. That's scripture. We need to look to God for the correct answer. Verse 5, they look for spiritual power in other Christians. They will see other Christians uh, maybe prophesying, maybe edifying, and they want to try to emulate that. They're, they're, uh, what is the word I'm looking for? They want to clone themselves to be like that. When in fact, the Bible says they have a form of godliness. Now, again, if you have any thoughts that this is a negative message, read the Bible. When we read these verses, we automatically think this is the world. You know, I've said it, you've said it. Yeah, the world is getting worse. Oh, God, I hope God comes soon. I can't take much more of it. Well, let's have a look in our own backyard. Let's just be honest. 
the apostles, the prophets, they prayed for understanding in their lives when they sinned as David did. He said, I have sinned against you, God, and you only. So we have to be able to discern right from wrong. How do we know that? We ask the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, enlighten us to the discernment of this individual or this preaching and teaching. But this has always been in the world, as I said earlier. It was there before the flood, no doubt, all of these, these uh, thoughts here that Paul was teaching Timothy. They were there before Sodom and Gomorrah. So the church is not immune from the world. What do I mean by that? I can't tell someone, I've, I've talked to different individuals and, and I leave it in the hands of God, well, a, a casual drink is okay. It's all right with me. I'm talking about things that I don't want to do. Uh, play the lottery. Well, if I win the lottery, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna give a big chunk of that to the church. God owns a cattle on a thousand hills. The streets are gold. And he wants your offering? Gambling? Paul is teaching Timothy, then as well as now, these are the verses that has crept into the church. I'm going to repeat this. Paul is teaching Timothy, then as well as now, these are the verses that has crept into the church in some cases. Not the whole church, I said in some cases. In this study, we will see how Christians can overcome. That'll be later on. Next week, I will give you a little heads up. I want to break down those words. Perilous times, lovers of their own flesh, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those who are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures, more than lovers of God. I want to break those down and see if those are any that you recognize uh, from individuals in your life, be it Christian or sinners. Okay, I trust you got something out of this. I pray that uh, I didn't come across as being too direct, but I don't think this Bible cannot be direct. We can't go around it to get what we want. Here's, here's the real problem. Ask ourselves. I ask myself, say this quite often to myself. I want to go to heaven. I want to go there. Why? Well, of course, to see the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. Some say we may see the Holy Ghost, we may not. I don't care. I just want to go to heaven. Yes, I have a wife there. I have a son there. I want to go to heaven. But let me tell you, the alternative, according to this book, this Bible, it's not pleasant. Wailing and gnashing of teeth for eternity. So, uh, in the studies coming up, we're going to break down these words here. And then we're going to go ahead and show how the church can come out of the apostasy. Have a great day.